Summary of Motherless Brooklyn by Jonathan Letham. Lionel Esrog is a self-proclaimed detective who really suffers from Tourette's syndrome, a neurological condition that causes him to do and say things over and over again. Esrog does not have any credentials in the field. Lionel and his partner, Gilbert Coney, are on a stakeout in the New York City area of Yorkville. Gilbert, Lionel, Tony Vermonti, and Danny Fantel grew up together in a home in Brooklyn. When they were young, they were hired by Frank Mina, a penny ante hood with ties to the mafia, to work for him. Over the years, Mina has become like a father to all four Mina men. Lionel and Gilbert sit and listen while Frank, who is wearing a wire, goes into a zendo, a Buddhist study center, and meets with someone they don't know. Lionel eats White Castle burgers to calm himself down when he is worried. Lionel listens as Mina talks to his friend, whose voice Lionel doesn't recognize, about a woman he doesn't know the name of, a guy named Ullman, and something called a Ramalama Ding Dong. Frank tells the men the code so they know he's leaving the zendo. Frank is rushed downstairs and into a car by a big man, who then starts driving away. Lionel and Gilbert give chase, counting on Frank, who is still wearing a wire, to lead them to Greenpoint, a Polish area in Brooklyn. There, Lionel finds Mina, who has been stabbed, in a trash can. Lionel and Gilbert get Mina to the hospital as fast as they can. On the way, Lionel makes jokes to make Mina feel better, but Mina knows he is going to die soon. Just before Gilbert pulls up to the hospital, Mina drops his cell phone, wallet, and watch on the floor. Inside, the doctors can't bring Mina back to life. Lionel and Gilbert run away and head for the window of Landel, a car service that is really a front for the detective agency that Mina started and is run by the orphans he took in as kids. Lionel starts to think about his childhood and how Mina introduced him to crime. He remembers that many of Mina's crimes were done in the name of the clients, two old Italian men named Roccafort and Matricardi. Lionel only remembers meeting the clients once, when he was moving stolen music equipment into the upper floors of an abandoned home that the men used as their base. Gerard, Frank's older brother, was also in the background of these deals. Lionel met Gerard twice. The second time, Gerard had come to Brooklyn to hurry Mina away upstate after a business deal had gone wrong. Lionel remembers that when Mina came back years later, he was with his new wife Julia and had a dream of starting a real detective service. Still, Mina had to work in the Brooklyn underworld to make ends meet. Lionel says that Mina, who was biased but always had a smile on his face, used humor to deal with the stressful demands of his job. Lionel remembers a joke about a Jewish woman who goes to Tibet and says she wants to meet the High Lama. After working hard to get a meeting with the Lama, the Jewish woman scolds him, calling him Irving, for being away from home for so long. She and his father are worried about when their son will return. Back at Landel, Tony tells Gilbert to find out what's going on with Ullman and sends Lionel to tell Julia the news. Lionel goes to Frank and Julia's apartment and finds Julia packing. She is getting ready to leave town and is taking a gun with her. Julia says the hospital did call to let her know about Frank. Julia is upset but not very sad. She talks about how, over the course of their marriage, Frank removed the person she used to be. When Lionel asks Julia where she's going, she says she's going to a place of peace. Julia's car is waiting for her downstairs, so Lionel helps her get there. Lucius Seminole, a black detective who is looking into Frank's death, tries to stop Julia from going, but he can't because he doesn't have an order. Then, Seminole asks Lionel to follow him around town so they can share what they know. Lionel's obsessive behavior and the casual way he put sandwiches in magazines on Frank's tab at several convenience shops make Seminole suspicious, but Lionel says he wants to find Frank's killer just as much as the detective. Lionel is left alone by Seminole, and he goes back to his flat above the Landel shop. Lionel goes downstairs to answer the phone. It's Loomis, a garbage cop who works with the Mina men. Loomis says that Gilbert has been taken into custody for killing Ullman. Lionel goes to the police station where Gilbert is being held, but he can't see him. Lionel picks up Loomis and takes him back to Landel. 
He then goes to his own room for the night. Lionel eats a lunch and then lets himself cry for the first time. Lionel puts Minna's beeper on his belt in the morning and goes back to the Zendo, where he meets a student named Kimari. Kimari tells Lionel to come to a class later so he can see the Rashi, or head teacher, and some important teachers who are visiting the Zendo. As Lionel is leaving, for bad guys grab him and force him into a car. They tell him that they were told to scare him into staying away from the Zendo. Lionel doesn't let the new thugs scare him, so they end up leaving him in their car. Lionel sees that the car is rented by the Fujisaki Corporation at 1030 Park Avenue. Lionel calls Loomis on the cell phone that was left in the car and asks him to find out as much as he can about the building. Lionel himself goes to the building, but the doormen kick him out. Lionel calls Tony, and Tony tells Lionel to stop looking into it. Lionel hangs up because he is suspicious. When Frank's beeper goes off, Lionel calls the number and finds out that it's the clients. Lionel is told to come see them. Lionel goes to Brooklyn, where the clients tell him he should work with Tony instead of against him to bring Julia home and find out her secrets. Lionel feels uncomfortable when he leaves the meeting. Even more disturbing is the fact that Tony is waiting outside with a gun. The standoff is broken up by Seminole. He tells the guys that he has lost track of Julia since she flew to Boston and that he doesn't want to get too involved with the mob. So that he can talk to Tony alone, Seminole tells Lionel to leave. He goes back to the Zendo. While they are on their way, Loomis calls to tell them about 1030 Park. He thinks that the rich people there own half of New York. He has also found out that Fujisaki's books were kept by Ullman. When Lionel gets to the Zendo, Kimari takes him to a room with a lot of students. The Rashi and a group of Japanese monks walk in, and Lionel sees the giant in the corner of the room. Lionel sees that the Rashi is really Gerard when he looks at him carefully. Lionel starts to have tics. Gerard gives a nod to the big, who then drags Lionel out of the room, takes him to an alley, and beats him up. Kimari will pick up Lionel. He goes back to her room with her. As Lionel relaxes on her bed, he looks through the books on her desk and finds a pamphlet for another Zen vacation in Maine called A Place of Peace. Lionel starts to do ticks again, but Kimari, who is curious about him, seduces him. Lionel and Kimari get intimate. Lionel sneaks into the kitchen in the middle of the night, takes Kimari's keys, and then leaves. Lionel goes back to the Zendo and lets himself in. He then goes to talk to Gerard. Gerard tells Lionel that Frank and Ullman used to work for Fujisaki, but they got into trouble when they started stealing from the company. Gerard tells Lionel not to get involved. Lionel goes back to Landel, but when he sees the giant watching Tony and Danny from a car outside the shop, he sneaks into an Landel car and does his own stakeout. Tony gets in a car in the morning and starts to drive. The giant keeps up with him, and Lionel keeps up with the giant. As Lionel follows Tony and the giant north from New York, he figures out that they are going to the resort in Maine. Lionel finds the retreat in a town called Muskingus Point Station. He also finds Yoshi's, a seafood diner that is related to the retreat. After asking around about the refuge and restaurant on the docks, Mr. Foible, a fisherman, tells Lionel that the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mob, has been coming to Maine for a long time to fish for sea urchin. In Japan, sea urchin eggs are a delicacy, but overfishing has made them even harder to find. Foible brags that he doesn't have to deal with the mob anymore because he has a deal with the Fujisaki Corporation, which owns the restaurant that gives him a monopoly. When Lionel goes to the restaurant, he is surprised to see Julia working there as a waitress. When the monks from the Zendo come in, dressed in fancy clothes that show they are really from the Fujisaki Corporation, Lionel is even more shocked. Julia tells Lionel to get going and meet her later at a nearby lighthouse. Lionel sees the giant going through Tony's car and throwing his things into the ocean after he has left. Lionel figures out that the big guy killed Tony. Lionel sees the giant, so he tries to get away in his car. During the chase, 
he catches the giant by making him crash his car into a set of spikes at the edge of a paid parking lot. Lionel calls the clients to tell them that Gerard killed Frank and killed Tony, and that Frank's death was Gerard's fault. Then, Lionel goes to see Julia. She tells him about her life, including how she has been connected to the main Zendo for a long time and how she knows both Minna brothers. She says that Gerard was her Ramalama Ding Dong. They met when Gerard came to the retreat years ago, but as Gerard studied Zen more deeply, he became more distant, and she turned to Frank for support. Gerard and Frank's business with the mob and the Yakuza, on the other hand, made her more and more worried. First, Frank betrayed Gerard to the Italian gang, forcing Gerard to hide at the Zendo. Later, Gerard betrayed Frank to the Japanese, causing Gerard to order Frank's death as a sacrifice that would show Gerard's loyalty to the Japanese. Lionel thinks that Gerard told the giant to kill Frank. Julia pulls a gun on Lionel because she refuses to believe that he killed Frank and is sure that he did it. Tony's gun is pulled on her by Lionel. After throwing his own gun into the water to get Julia's attention, Lionel runs up to her and throws her gun into the water as well. Then he feels like he has to throw three more things into the water, including one of his own shoes. Julia goes away. Lionel drives back to Brooklyn, where he soon finds out that Gerard has disappeared. Lionel chooses to act like the older Minna brother died while he was sleeping. Danny, Gilbert, Loomis, and Lionel get to work making Landel a real detective service, which is what Frank has always wanted. The Yorkville Zendo is no longer there. Lionel is still worried about the shady side of society, but he vowed to put off revenge and decided to move on with his life. About the author Jonathan Letham was born in Brooklyn to artist and political active parents. Letham's family lived in Borum Hills community. Letham's early art was influenced by Bob Dylan, Star Wars, and the books of Philip K. Dick, The Man in the High Castle, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, A Scanner Darkly. Letham wanted to be an artist all through high school, and he later went to Bennington College as a student. Bennington was a hub for liberal arts, and that's where Letham met writers like Donna Tartt and Brett Easton Ellis, who would later become his peers. However, the rich and secluded atmosphere at Bennington also showed Letham for the first time the harsh truths of class luxury. Letham went to California and started putting out short stories after he got there. In 1994, his first book, Gun, with occasional music, came out. Letham quickly became known as a talented writer who was able to blend literary fiction with genre ideas. He did this by writing easily about science fiction, noir, post-apocalyptic fiction, and mystery stories. Letham moved back to Brooklyn, where he kept writing genre-bending books like Girl in Landscape and Motherless Brooklyn, which won him a National Book Critics Circle Award. Letham got a genius grant from MacArthur in 2005. Letham is one of the most bold voices in modern literature. He has written more than 15 works of fiction and often writes for magazines like Rolling Stone, Harper's, and The New Yorker. He is a creative writing professor at Pomona College in Claremont, California. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.